good. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a long day today. This is our final session, and I know people are uh, tired, but uh, let's get through this uh, final but very important session. And um, the the first two panels we addressed the big broad. Uh, uh, issues like strategic uh, triangle and the uh, history issues. Now we wanted to get down to the specifics of decision making process uh, uh, of the uh, uh, Chinese policy to Japan, Japan's policy to China, or in Japan's overall foreign policy and security policy making. So the, we wanted to open up the black box and look at the, how the system works, uh, how specific uh, policy initiatives were formulated and then implemented. So that for that purpose, we gathered a group of uh, uh, distinguished experts uh, on this topic. Uh, we will start with Professor Corey Wallace from Kanagawa University, who will speak about Japan's policy making in defense and security policy overall. And then that will be followed by Professor Zakowski, uh, uh, who will concentrate on Japan's uh, China policy making. Um, and then we will have a China expert, uh, Chisa, uh, Chisa Komaso, who will address Chinese foreign and security policy making under Xi Jinping. So it's a very current, very uh, contemporary period. And last but not least, uh, uh, Gongju Wacker, Professor Gongju Wacker, will talk about American uh, perspective, how the uh, American policy on China is formed, um, looking uh, from the perspective of the uh, uh, political party politics. All right, so I'll start with Corey. Did you need to show slides or, or not? Okay. Yep, I'll share them now. I believe that should work. Okay, good, good, good. That's okay. Okay, does that, does that work okay? Yes, yes, good. Everyone can hear. Okay, so. You can see, uh, we'll talk about the sort of policy defense process, and I've uh, decided to focus on uh, the budget and defense spending, which might normally be uh, not such a stimulating topic. But uh, over the last couple of years, there have been some movements, and as someone who's been following us for a while, I would actually argue possibly still put a possible on that could be some of the most important and meaningful changes. Uh, Japan's engagement in, in the 1980s. Now, I know defense is not always everything about spending, and there are many, many other things important to the defense model policy making process, but the reality is, is that without money, uh, many things can't happen. So let me just sort of take you through a, as much as I can, 10 minutes, some of the key points. So, um, you know, if you hear a couple of, just take a couple of narratives from the media, the uh, English speaking media, at least on Japan, and Consistently, you'll hear over the last two decades, Japanese are becoming increasingly worried about China. Okay. Um, and then the second one, of course, especially during the Army administration, is that Japan sets a record setting budget yet again uh, every single year, um, especially during the Abe, Abe years. And now, of course, the, the first of those is correct, of course, in terms of the threat perception. But if you actually look at um, the uh, increase in nominal defense spending over the, even the other years, it was pretty, pretty modest. And so you can look at this in, in, a, in a, a number of different ways. So this one is just, you know, nominal budget increase in Japanese defense. Um, you know, here are the year on year increases that have actually gone down over time. Um, if you want to look at it in real terms, um, Essentially, Japan didn't get back to the 1998 level of defense spending until 2020, just when Abe actually stood down. So it, in some ways, I've often described this as uh, you know, running faster to keep up. Um, just the same thing, though, on real defense spending. Um, and of course, here's the big, big comparison that uh, you'll see. I think The Economist has a famous graph similar to this. It's just how uh, how much the uh, imbalance or the relative difference in Chinese and Japanese defense spending uh, has become over time. And so if Japan, as the public tells us, and as uh, Japanese elite policymakers tell us, they are genuinely 
uh, afraid of China, they've got a funny way of showing it in terms of how these perceptions and these threats get turned into outcomes. Now, the other thing too is it's important to recognize it's not just economic or geopolitical pressures that's the problem with the Japanese budget, defense budget. And you know, no one likes spending money on, uh, well, some people certainly don't like spending money on defense, but generally most people don't like it. But it's important to recognize that there are also some internal pressures on Japan's defense budget from you know, increased operational tempo, purchase of expensive foreign military aircraft, the need for repairs and maintenance for um, these military platforms and so forth. So again, in terms of the internal pressures, um, you can see that maintenance expenses have gone up quite considerably um, over the last uh, 20 years or so. So that's eating into a relatively constant um, uh, budgetary pool uh, maintenance. And that sort of almost creates a vicious cycle because uh, the more maintenance you have to perform on uh, your platform, military platforms, um, the less money you have available to buy newer platforms, which they generally less need less maintenance when the process renews itself. Um, and in fact, I had a look at this, and even I was a little bit surprised that there have been quite a lot of periods where the increase in maintenance costs themselves have outweighed the increases in Japan's uh, defense budget year on year. Not every year, but in quite a number of years over the last couple of decades. Um, there's also the issue of foreign military sales purchases, which basically means American aircraft for the most part. They have gone up considerably over the last decade. And of course, that's a bit of an issue because of the, uh, 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 no, no, none more so than now, the uh, yen exchange rate. Um, but one of the other strange things is that um, it's resulted in the uh, less spending on naval aircraft. And that's kind of an interesting thing considering that maritime security seems to be something that Japan uh, should be putting a lot more emphasis on. Um, so anyway, um, there's also been greater use of this sort of what they, was called a forward expenditure system. It's a, a really, complex system that every, every time I have to think about it, I have to uh, re revise about it as well. But basically the best way to describe it is, Japan's tried to balance a lot of these pressures by writing these IOUs to the Ministry of Finance. And basically it allows them to put some of these burdens out for future years. And before that was made sense for things like, you know, big batches of aircraft, which, you know, you buy in five year allotments and things like that. But recently the government's been forced to sort of, even maintenance costs, contracts for that have to be sort of pushed back to future years. Um, in 2015, the government very quietly extended the ability to, to use this system to 10 years. And in 2018, there were reports that the Ministry of Defense had, had, had to kind of go around and sort of beg Japanese companies to maybe allow them to push back some of their payments due, um, in general, because they were paying so much for these uh, foreign military sales. Um, and so, you can sort of see this in the in the maintenance costs on a contract basis. Over the last 20 years, they paint an even uh, actually more disturbing picture of uh, basically doubling, um, and a lot of this has been put out to uh, future years. And so what this has resulted in is a huge increase in aircraft procurement. Um, other equipment procurement has gone down, shipbuilding has gone down, and research and development has also gone down as well. Um, I'll skip over all this, not too important, it's just other stuff. So anyway, uh, we come to the 2021 LDP leadership election. And it's clear to a lot of people who are interested in security issues, far from necessarily Japan uh, going ahead and uh, like nothing else, that there's actually a bit of a crisis within the Japanese defense budget. Um, and the defense, the danger is not only of being outmuscled by our but also of becoming a less capable ally, despite the changes and the promises that Japan sort of made, has made over the last decade or so in terms of better integration uh, with the United States, as well as with many other militaries throughout the Indo-Pacific region. So a lot of the, the, the four candidates for the uh, LDP presidential race and the next prime minister after Suga stood down, basically three of them came out with quite hawkish positions. 
Um, and you could sort of describe this in many ways. Um, they were universally in agreement about giving more resources to the Japan Coast Guard. Uh, the possibility of uh, Japan getting so-called strike capabilities. And many of them touched on, which was quite unusual for uh, uh, Japan, Japanese politics in general, or touched on the issue of Taiwan's uh, uh, defense, which was uh, something I have seen dealt with so publicly before. And on defense spending itself, they were all, with the exception of uh, uh, Noda, in agreement that something had to happen in terms of defense spending. Cornell didn't want to say how much, but he really emphasized the need for major investment in R&D. Um, Shida, similarly, but he also um, said he wouldn't be bound by the 1% GDP mark. He's now the prime minister. Um, Kono's now the digital minister. And Takaichi was the most clear saying that the NATO 2% target of 2% uh, of GDP target should now be Japan's target. She's just been nominated to the economic security minister after being LDP policy chief. Um, and the 2% indicator, and while in very vague terms, did end up making it into the LDP election manifesto. So there was a sense that something would happen, and this came in the 2021 supplementary budget. Now, the budget was supposed to be for post COVID fiscal recovery, but, uh, but it also included um, something called the Defense Strengthening Acceleration Package, which came with a 7.74, uh, sorry, 774 billion yen. And this was the highest supplementary budget if you leave aside the 2000, uh, for defense, if you leave aside the, uh, the recovery supplements for repairs and so forth after 311. And what this is, is a, a really good example of Japan's increasing use of 15 month budgets, which I know sounds unusual, but um, over the last decade, uh, most years it's more than not, uh, supplementary budgets have been used to sort of back up the original budget, um, uh, defense budget for Japan to you know, address some of these issues of not paying contractors and very basic stuff that you expect of, a, uh, of the government. And of course, uh, probably this is something we'll, we'll maybe talk about in discussion is that there's the, as Kishida announced the uh, review of the three key strategic documents. So anyway, even with this, if I went back and had a look and included all the supplementary budgets and the figures and um, you start to see uh, a little bit over the last couple of years of a, I'm sorry, the last year or so, a little bit of a uh, movement up there. Um, that's looking a little bit better, but I was still sort of in general um, a little bit um, wondering if this would was just a one-off or would this be something else? Because after all, this was a post-COVID fiscal uh, supplementary budget. Like this doesn't happen very often. So, and if you look at it uh, into greater detail, just skip down to the bottom here, more than 50% of it was just simply for making up payments to contractors that had that they'd already fallen behind. So there was, I guess you could say there was still a concern that this was going to be a one-off, um, that there wasn't going to necessarily be um, as generous supplementary budgets in the future as a post-COVID-19 fiscal injection. Um, was this going to be um, uh, all Kashida was going to do on the defense area. And then suddenly Ukraine, and I mean, we can talk about this, but it's, it's been interesting to me to watch, you know, these, you know, decades of narratives of pressure from China and warnings from inside Japan, and at times warnings from alliance partners about how Japan needed to take its defense seriously and how it needed to spend more and all that sort of stuff. But it seems to me to, that Ukraine really and maybe this won't be sustained, but really drove a quite a different, uh, a change in awareness amongst the public, at least anyway. And there's always been some kind of gradual increase in support for defense strengthening, but whenever you ask people whether they want to put money to that, they've usually been quite, uh, uh, they prefer the, the status quo. But we start to see, um, depending on how the opinion polls are framed, uh, support coming in for increased defense spending, if not uh, 
increasing it from one to two percent. Uh, so, you know, the, the different survey companies uh, ask the question in many different ways, but however, however you slice it, there's actually a uh, degree of support for um, some kind of substantive increase, which I guess would mean going beyond the 1% of GDP market. And this is the first time I've, you know, following all these polls and so forth over the years, I've actually seen this. So that's very interesting. It may not be sustained, and perhaps if Kishida's popularity plummets, um, uh, that might go the opposite direction, um, as the Asahi poll here perhaps suggests. Uh, so anyway, perhaps this is a good place to sort of finish off. The uh, Ministry of Defense has just, within this week, put out a uh, budget proposal. And this one, perhaps with the intervention of Ukraine and the change in the public awareness and everything else, actually seems to suggest that we might have multiple years of uh, defense increase. So a couple of months ago, there was the uh, so-called uh, which is the draft budget principles. And it had some really interesting wording that I've never seen before. It was, before it was always like, strengthen Japan's defense capabilities, you know, somewhat strengthened. This time it was drastically strengthened Japan's defense capabilities within five years. And this within five years is quite, important. And the only reason why it's there is the elderly, the Ministry of Finance apparently um, was okay with drastically spent, uh, strengthened, but the LDP, uh, when they saw the original draft of the draft, um, basically uh, uh, they pushed back on that and demanded that defense would be treated as special in this, uh, in the, in the coming years and somewhat separate from uh, other fiscal priorities. Um, and so when this, this budget came through, it was, the initial budget was 5.5 .5 trillion yen plus 90 uh, jiko yoku, basically uncosted items to be announced later. And so this, for an initial budget, this is already quite significant and it's probably um, going to go over perhaps 6 billion, uh, 6 trillion yen. And Normally what happens with these budget requests is that the Ministry of Defense makes the request, the Ministry of Finance says, no, 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 you're gonna to have to go down to 1% or less. But the wording and the, the noises coming out of uh, even Cometo, which is usually quite um, restrained on this, is that this year, uh, the Ministry of Finance won't be able to um, impose itself the way it usually does on these negotiations. And so it could end up being quite a significant amount going over time. And so if you're interested in the, 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 the old figure of defense spending as a percentage of GDP, it went over 1% last year. Um, and with the potential anticipated increase this year, it might go over 1.1%. And um, it will be very interesting to see uh, what comes through in the revision of the strategic documents in terms of the long-term priorities. Uh, usually the midterm defense plan has a five-year pool of money that, that roughly tells us how much um, is going to be spent over the next few years. Um, and I'll just finish off with this. One thing to keep in mind is that um, because it's going from a, a low base, uh, to actually achieve the 2% target, it would, if Japan increased its defense at 300 billion per year, which is basically what it's done the last couple of years, um, it would still take 20 years to get to, uh, take 10 years to get to 1.5% and 20 years to get to the 2%. If it was a bit bolder and it did 500 billion per year, um, assuming something like 1.5 to 2% economic growth, it would take about um, a little bit less than it, obviously. And uh, if you look at this sort of orange line, that basically would mean that Japan in 20 years time is spending 16 trillion yen or roughly three times as much as it does now. Of course, if we uh, translate that into um, comparative, and, and if we think about that in relative terms, that would still be half of what uh, China currently spends or will spend in the next few years on defense. But nevertheless, uh, I guess you would probably see some small movement 
instead of like this, you probably see some small movement upwards by Japan in terms of expenses. Anyway, I could go into lots of other stuff and details, but I think this is a good place to um, just leave this topic and, uh, you know, money, this money has a lot of potential uses and how Japan actually makes decisions about the use of any additional money is also an extremely important topic. And uh, as Julio knows, I have my own ideas and thoughts about that. Um, it's sometimes different from even the government. But anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. First, let me uh, thank for the invitation to this wonderful workshop. As you can see, the topic of my presentation is Japan's China policy making, and I will focus on the main factors, both in the government and in the ruling party that influenced the policy making process towards China in the post war period. And until the 1990s, I will try to analyze the role of factional dynamics in the LDP because it was one of the major factors influencing um, Ch Japan's China policy. But um, factions weakened in the 1990s and we can see a major increase in prime minister's role. So I will focus on that as well. And I will also emphasize the role of uh, usage of bureaucrats by the prime minister which was uh, facilitated by the administrative reforms by Hashimoto but also, also institutional changes uh, implemented by Abe. Uh, first, uh, traditionally Japanese prime ministers weren't perceived as strong decision makers um, but uh, they had greater room for maneuver in foreign policy making than in other policy fields. Uh, they were constrained by divisions in the ruling party by factions and uh, by strong bureaucrats in different ministries so they have to keep balance between ministries keep balance between factions and it was a um, difficult task uh, in 1994 uh, electoral system was revised uh, which led to the weakening of factions factions uh, were uh, the most important group uh, that a politician could belong to in LDP and his career or her career depended on uh, participation in one faction or another, but it changed. And that's why uh, also factions are no longer important when talking about different factors influencing LDP's uh, policy towards China. Uh, at least in my opinion, they play a very, uh, very uh, small role nowadays. Another turning point were administrative reforms. Mainly, I will um, put emphasis on the weakening of the rule of dispersed management, Buntan Kanri Gensoku, which uh, existed uh, until 2001 and uh, which constrained the, pri the prime minister because the prime minister could not initiate policies that fell within jurisdiction of uh, any of the ministries. Uh, it was presume that the minister should initiate such policies and the minister very often was um, uh, relied on the bureaucrats and that's why the prime minister could not initiate many policies in uh, foreign policy without relying on foreign minister as well but it changed and now it is possible for prime ministers to more strategically use the bureaucrats in MOFA uh, thanks to the weakening of that uh, of that um, principle 
first, uh, let me say a few words about LDB factions, because until the 1990s, I analyzed um, in part detail in my PhD this dissertation, LDP's policy towards uh, China through the lens of factional dynamics in the LDP. Factions uh, were considered groups without political programs. Obviously, they were composed of politicians uh, who had various political stances, but they had different ideological views that uh, came from the political convictions of uh, charismatic uh, faction bosses. And it was, uh, I was able to simplify and uh, simply presume that fa uh, factions uh, ideological hue was uh, uh, the same as the f bosses um, political stance because um, the followers had to obey the faction boss. And um, of course it is a simplification, but still um, it is a useful analytical framework. So China policy was one of several axes of factional rivalry along with the other ones, usually not the most important one, usually the secondary one or even less important, but sometimes just as in 1972, it uh, played a crucial role in election of LDP president. Uh, and uh, in my analysis, I uh, tried to examine the composition of LDP mainstreams. Mainstreams were form of those factions which uh, supported the winning candidate in LDP presidential election. And um, the composition of the, the mainstream, to some extent, influenced uh, LDP's China policy, because it was a factor that either facilitated or hindered a response um, to external factors by the prime minister. Uh, so it's uh, quite similar to uh, Julius' thesis um, on neoclassical realism. Uh, if we take into account decision-making process in the LDP, of course, every decision had to be authorized by the General Council. And sometimes uh, during the breakthroughs in policy towards China, just as in 1972, um, the, the, the LDP leader asked all uh, parliamentarians uh, uh, simply held discussion in a special conference. So, and it, the decision was later authorized as a party decision. So we have to remember about that as well. On this graph, you can see composition of mainstreams. And um, it's quite a useful analytical tool because it shows us that pro-Taiwan factions dominated until 1972. Uh, mainly due to the fact that uh, Sato TC factions were, could be considered as pro-Taiwanese. Also, the Sato later Tanaka faction was the least ideological one, and it led the breakthrough in 1972. Uh, we can see neutral factions as well. Of course, it is based on far going si uh, simplification, because uh, as I already told you, even in pro-Beijing factions, there were a lot of pro-Taiwan politicians and vice versa. But they had to remain loyal towards the faction boss. And um, for that reason, uh, it was an important factor that either uh, facilitated um, uh, rapprochement with China or hindered it. Let's uh, pay attention, for, for instance, uh, to the fact that only twice um, before 1972 did the pro Beijing factions prevail in the mainstreams uh, during the short lived Ishibashi. Um, uh, term that it was only three months and later during the second mainstream of Ikeda Hayato. At first Ikeda relied on an alliance with Kishi and Sato but it's, he switched to Niki Matsumura faction and other factions so at that time um, pro-Beijing factions started dominating in the mainstream and it facilitated the signature of Liao Takasaki agreement semi-official trade agreement with China. And then the breakthrough, of course, 1972, when the tanaka Okira um, axis was formed, a very permanent alliance formed by two friends, close friends. The previous permanent alliance was between Kishi and Sato, who were brothers, of course. And uh, why did Miki not lead a breakthrough in um, ap approach towards China? Not only because of the international conditions, of course, the situation in China was uh, crucial, but also due to the fact that he relied on um, alliance with pro-Taiwan factions such as Fukuda's. And later, uh, why did uh, Fukuda lead the breakthrough, the sign signature of, um, uh, of uh, 
friendship, uh, tre peace and friendship treaty in 1978, not only due to the international conditions, which of course were uh, a decisive factor, but it was facilitated by the fact that uh, Tanaka and Ohira, we have to remember about that, were within the mainstream of Fukuda. Uh, so uh, it was a secret agreement of 1976 that uh, uh, Fukuda would cede leadership uh, to Ohira. Uh, so, obviously, it wasn't a single factor. It wasn't perhaps even the most important factor that shaped uh, LDP's China policy, but it had, has to be taken into account. The result was a so-called friendship diplomacy that relied on uh, faction leaders and um, important heavyweight politicians from the pro-Beijing factions, mainly those originating from the uh, Tanaka and Ohira factions, uh, which led uh, normalization of Sino-Japanese relations. Uh, and uh, it is thanks to them, it, this system worked for many years, because heavyweight politicians, whenever there was a crisis, they could contact uh, their counterparts, uh, influential politicians in the CCP behind um, the scenes and negotiate gentlemen's agreements uh, uh, that led to, well, uh, ending the crisis. But the problem is that, of course, uh, due to the fact that frictions between China and Japan escalated in the 1990s, uh, it no longer became beneficial for politicians to specialize in China issues and uh, a lot of pro-Beijing politicians retired. Interestingly, I guess LDP leadership was a aware of that uh, problem and it tried to institutionalize relations with the CCP. In 2004, the um, Sino-Japanese conference of exchange between the ruling parties, Nichiyoto Koryu Kyogitai was formed and it was to supplement the friendship diplomacy. But it turned out that it wasn't that easy to uh, replace pro-Beijing politicians through more formal ties between two parties because um, uh, the, the contacts were channeled through, uh, of course, of, uh, officers, uh, through persons who served as, uh, from the Japanese side, uh, Policy Affairs Research Council chairs or Secretary General, General since 2015, and uh, from the Chinese side, the heads of the CCP International Liaison Department of the Central Committee. So, uh, but the, with such persons as Asotaro, uh, uh, or Nakagawa Hidenao assuming these posts, it was difficult to stabilize friendship policy, friendship diplomacy towards China. It was no longer a friendship diplomacy, and that's why um, it affected uh, relations with uh, China. Speaking about the foreign minister's role, he was constrained by the bureaucrats, uh, who, uh, especially uh, by uh, the administrative vice minister, many foreign ministers did not have uh, sufficient experience to play a, a major role in um, forming China policy, but there were exceptions. And until the 1990s, we once more returned to factionalism. Uh, those uh, politicians who were faction leaders, influential faction leaders, had, had a greater ability to influence uh, policy towards China, such as Okira Masayoshi under the second uh, Ikeda mainstream from 62 to say 64, and of course under the Tanaka cabinet 72, 74, or Fukuda Takeo, who under the Sato uh, government was also a foreign minister. Um, perhaps we could also mention Tsunoda Sunao, maybe he's, he was not such a heavyweight politician, but he also played a role in negotiations uh, of the 1978 treaty. But foreign ministers uh, were overshadowed by the prime minister after the administrative reforms. So we can see that Kishida didn't really play a great role under the other administration, despite the fact that he was a leader of one of major factions in, inside the LDP. It, it was the Kante, it was the prime minister who led uh, policy towards uh, China. And um, of crucial importance nowadays uh, are these bureaucratic channels. Uh, but they depend on proximity towards the prime minister. Uh, bureaucrats have always been important in uh, forming China policy, but not in uh, preparing breakthroughs. Uh, of course, they supported politicians. They prepared uh, the text of treaties and so on. 
uh, so they were used as instruments rather than uh, decision makers. Uh, they guarded also the um, uh, consistency of agreements with China's, with China, with pre previous policies. Uh, but uh, China school has waned in MOFA, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and after the administrative reforms, we can see a new phenomenon. Um, that is uh, the problem that Julia described in his book. Um, they, now it is more, um, it is easier for the prime minister to strategically use individual bureaucrats, even over the head of, um, of uh, the foreign minister. Uh, it wasn't only Abe, it started uh, under Koizumi with uh, Tanaka Hitoshi, for instance, who contacted directly uh, Koizumi, who met with Koizumi when he negotiated secretly uh, Koizumi's uh, surprise visit to North Korea. Uh, he didn't really, uh, well, consult with, um, with foreign minister. Of course, uh, foreign minister knew about these negotiations, but uh, she uh, didn't, uh, well, uh, influence uh, them much. How much Kamaguchi? Um, uh, but, uh, well, Tanaka's role was, uh, was very important. And of course, Yachi's role, even more prominent bureaucrat who became national security advisor. So to conclude, uh, we can see a decreasing role of LDP factional dynamics in China policy making. They aren't important anymore, in, in my opinion, because it, uh, politicians don't have to be loyal towards factional bosses. If they don't have to be loyal towards them, well, factions have always been quite diverse in terms of politicians to belong to them. So now this diversity is even, uh, even more visible. Uh, but it is the uh, prime minister's role that um, uh, that strengthened, and uh, foreign minister's role uh, comparably uh, weakened um, in shaping China policy. Uh, while the bureaucrats and the backbenchers they still can play uh, important role in shaping China policy, uh, in supporting the prime minister, but it depends on the proximity to the prime minister. The prime minister may use still heavyweight politicians dispatch them to China's emissaries uh, or uh, high-ranking bureaucrats as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Policy making. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry, I unplugged the microphone. <laughs> um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to uh, bring uh, my short speech here today. I'm uh, I'm Chisako Masur from Kyushu University. Can all of you hear that? Uh, hear me online? Uh, <laughs> I hope my uh, the microphone is still working. Okay. Uh, today I'm going to talk about China's foreign and security policy making under Xi Jinping. Well, actually, I'm not a super expert on this topic. Uh, usually, I deal with uh, China's maritime policy. Uh, I had. Uh, I had a lot of fun uh, following China's state oceanic administration until uh, 2018 when it was dissolved, unfortunately for me. Uh, but uh, well, uh, so uh, but today uh, I, uh, uh, based on uh, that research, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, China's recent uh, changes in terms of foreign, foreign policy making. Well, uh, this morning, uh, well, this uh, early this afternoon, um, 
uh, Inan talked about uh, Xi Jinping's changes, uh, conceptual uh, uh, preparation uh, to uh, move into the next generation, uh, to, to bring China into the next generation. Uh, but uh, in my uh, talk, I would like to mention about his um, physical preparation uh, for the next generation. Okay. Uh, well, uh, well. Uh, in terms of uh, Chinese foreign, uh, foreign and security policy, uh, well, it is very clear that it has been going through this institutional reform. Well, uh, these two are the most important uh, organization. Uh, well, uh, Xi Jinping's way of handling issues is very clear. He's modeling Mao Zedong. Uh, you know, uh, well, in 1950s, uh, he wasn't very happy about uh, the the way things are handled because you know uh, foreign policy is something he thought uh, should be uh, led by the top leader. <laughs> so uh, he wasn't very happy. Uh, Premier Zhou Enlai was leading it at first. So uh, by uh, emphasizing the importance of party line, uh, he tried to steal the leadership of foreign and security policy from Zhou Enlai. And that's why he started to establish small leading group uh, inside the party, and uh, that's what Xi Jinping has been doing. So first in uh, 2014, uh, he uh, upgraded uh, the uh, leading group for uh, on security into the, uh, the well, an established National Security Commission. Uh, that involves a lot of um, provincial leaders as well as uh, many domestic actors, not only the military. Uh, and then uh, in 2018, along with uh, many other institutional reforms within the state uh, council, as well as in the, part, uh, the party organization, he also uh, upgraded uh, the small leading group uh, on the uh, foreign uh, policy and established this foreign affairs commission. Uh, and th uh, this, uh, uh, well, uh, this includes a lot of uh, external, uh, uh, a lot of organization in relation to the external affairs. But what was uh, very interesting was that uh, uh, this time he also, uh, or Xi Jinping administration established a new um, sort of uh, uh, line that extends to the provincial level. So, uh, you know, uh, China's foreign policy is very diverse. Uh, foreign relation is uh, very diverse nowadays. But now, uh, you know, all the provincial level exchanges with other countries or everything what happens in the province level had to be uh, responsible, uh, had to be, uh, well, uh, had to be, uh, uh, had. Uh, how should I say, had to be led by uh, each uh, provincial uh, secretaries. Uh, so if anything wrong happens in that province, it's the uh, provincial secretaries who have to take care of them. So, uh, you know, by, uh, make, my, by uh, establishing those uh, new lines, of commands, uh, he actually tried to integrate everything under his command. Uh, so uh, every, everything what China does to foreign countries is led by him, and everything uh, inside domestically is led also led by him. So uh, this uh, is something he has been doing. And uh, this is the, <laughs> the thing I've been uh, studying for many years. Um, this is a very interesting new development I see uh, happening in China. Uh, last year uh, was the first year of the 14th five-year program. And uh, uh, starting from that, uh, China started to initiate this national territorial and spatial program. Well, we see a lot of uh, provincial level changes, uh, provincial level programs. However, uh, the national one is never publicized. But I think uh, that actually includes a lot of security uh, measures in it. And then uh, uh, this uh, illustration <laughs> I made up, shows the image of uh, China's spatial infrastructure it is uh, establishing. 
uh, since starting from the 13th uh, five-year program, uh, China has been uh, establishing the network of satellites, not only Beidou, but uh, it also includes a lot of communication satellites and also uh, remote sensing satellites. You know, uh, in, during the war of Ukraine, you know, uh, even though there are many clouds, uh, the military people could see uh, what is happening on the land. And uh, that, you know, those remote sensing satellites use that kind of technology to observe uh, what is happening on the Earth. So uh, the satellite network is something uh, Xi Jinping started to establish even during the 13th uh, five-year program. However, uh, in the 14th five-year program, it is very clear that he's also established, ex extending that to the undersea. Uh, well, uh, he's been <laughs> putting a lot of buoys on the you know, surface of the sea, but also, uh, Inside the sea, he's uh, building a lot of ca cable network to make uh, have the observation, and those uh, data are eventually collected on the Chinese continent and then analyzed uh, and sent to uh, the related uh, uh, authority. I think so. Um, and uh, what is interesting is that uh, I, I talked about this national territorial and spatial program. You know, it says territorial. However, uh, when China established this program, China combined a lot of, of varieties of different kinds of uh, uh, developing plans uh, that it used to have in, uh, in many provincial level, national level. And uh, that, that also included maritime programs. So actually, even though this says territorial, uh, you know, China regards the, uh, its uh, jurisdiction water as the maritime territory, right? So uh, China is also uh, ha uh, established many t uh, maritime territorial plans in this program. Uh, well, uh, they used to have the uh, two uh, national programs on in, uh, on the maritime area, but they were also included into this new pro program, and it is called spatial because probably because uh, it uses a lot of uh, uh, satellite and undersea technology. So uh, this is something I have been seeing, and uh, I would like to. Uh, Oh, sorry, there are too many letters, but I would like to con uh, connect that to Wang Yi's uh, recent journey to the South Pacific Island countries. Well, uh, uh, I think I don't need to repeat this, but uh, everybody knows that uh, Wang Yi has proposed uh, a multilateral agreement to those countries. Well, uh, the, uh, there is some confusion. Uh, some uh, media says, well, Chinese media says he proposed it to nine countries, and many Western countries say 10 countries. I don't know which number is correct. But uh, uh, and, uh, he proposed this, uh, the prospects for comprehensive uh, comprehensive developments and then uh, in the end it was denied it, it wasn't concluded this time however if you pay attention to uh, the Chinese uh, MOFA's uh, statement later on China uh, Wang Yi did conclude uh, many uh, dozens of uh, bilateral plans and uh, I think it's very worth uh, paying attention to this, to what has proposed by China in this scheme, because that also shows <laughs> what kind of you know, proposal China made bilaterally to those countries. Well, uh, according to, well, I don't have the draft, but uh, the draft was obtained by some of the Western media. So I, I just read uh, the AP's report and also Guardian's report. Uh, Guardian's was relatively uh, detailed. Um, China offered uh, first, uh, you know, uh, cooperation in traditional and non-security, uh, non-traditional security. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, uh, and China off is it, it was reported that China offered a lot of uh, economic uh, plans as well as uh, you know good proposals uh, in relation to climate change or things like that. But specifically, uh, uh, please pay attention to the you know in, in the middle. Uh, specifically, uh, China proposed uh, those countries to uh, 
formulate maritime spatial plans. Uh, and uh, well, I, I only I am going to I'm I'm only going to read the you know, blue letters. Uh, and also, um, I proposed uh, law enforcement uh, cooperation, fishery uh, cooperation, and our uh, maritime resource cooperation, and our cybersecurity or those uh, uh, and create creation of maritime maps. Uh, so, uh, uh, and um, those cooperation actually uses this, those uh, network because uh, in China, uh, well, uh, the authority is very keen on developing application technology that uses the data it collects with those uh, new type of infrastructure. And they have been discussing what to do with those. And of course, uh, they, it can be used for the military purposes, for sure. But at the same time, uh, China is trying to, uh, you know, win the heart of, you know, regular people uh, to, by improving uh, their, you know, regular, ordinary life. So uh, those blue letters uh, indicate what China has been, you know, uh, <laughs> developing domestically. But um, I think, uh, you know, um, so, uh, so actually those, this uh, multilateral uh, proposal shows that China has started to use uh, those technologies into the uh, diplomatic <laughs> proposals already, because uh, domestically, those technologies are probably matured to some degree. So now it has moved into the application phase. So, uh, and uh, what triggered me was that the question, who designs such a package? Because, you know, um, the, you know, range, of such a proposal is so big. Uh, and uh, well, um, uh, China always wanted to use, uh, wanted to develop uh, international public goods to win the hearts of the global south uh, by providing them economic and social benefits. Uh, but you know, they can also be used uh, for the military purposes, as, as I ha have mentioned, because uh, China is doing this mili civ uh, military civil fusion. And the, because the package covers too many fields, from the space, it extends from the space to maritime sciences, infrastructure building, climate change, natural resource development, international law and law enforcement, uh, national planning, and uh, potentially military affairs. So it cannot be designed by, by uh, the uh, Foreign Affairs Commission. So even though it was Wang Yi for po who proposed, who went to those countries and made the proposal, it shouldn't be this commission uh, that made this proposal, but perhaps by the uh, National Security uh, uh, Commission, uh, support, uh, probably uh, with support uh, from others. And I think so, uh, and uh, based on this, uh, I think uh, Xi Jinping is probably integrating many issues under him uh, to max well, and uh, he is keen on maximizing his uh, you know, uh, national strength uh, by utilizing the power of socialism. Uh, so, and um, since, since uh, it is very clear that he's, oh, he, he's a kind of security geek, uh, he securitizes various issues. So uh, I think uh, yeah, that, that uh, uh, maybe I'm not, uh, I hope I'm not speaking too, uh, too long. Uh, so uh, pr probably uh, I think uh, the way China uh, formulates the foreign uh, policy has been moving and then now uh, it has it includes more and more security concerns and it's discussed from the domestic perspective because uh, this commission includes a lot of domestic actors. 